All right. Good morning, everyone. Happy New Year. Uh, so I guess we're going back to remote for just a little bit. So sorry for the inconvenience. So I'm uh, Alan Jen. Um, I am uh, faculty in TTP and, and energy. And so hopefully everyone's in the right place. Uh, we're doing energy and transportation modeling or policy analysis. All right, so straight into it. Um, so the first two week of lectures are, are actually gonna be remote. Um, and that's because uh, some of us are be going, will be going to uh, Washington DC for a uh, TRB conference. And so lectures one and two um, are gonna be at the regular times for remotes and then three and four I'm gonna pre-record uh, and I'll just post it on, on Canvas and on YouTube. So you're welcome to uh, view those at any time. If you wanna actually watch those lectures live, I'm still gonna do it on Zoom because that's kind of the easiest way for me to, to record. Um, the times will be, uh, are, are listed here and it's using the, the same Zoom link, but you're not <clears throat> obligated at all to, to uh, attend those times because they're like totally off schedule. Um, okay, just pipe up if there are any questions about that. Um, you can uh, interrupt it at any time, either in chat or um, by voice. Okay, some quick course logistics. Uh, so I will be doing office hours um, on Mondays from 10 to 11 a.m. And those will be uh well hopefully in in person uh we'll see what the the if the university policy changes at all um but they're i'm planning to have them just in my office over in west village at the peach and ub center um but in the meantime if anyone has any questions or concerns and wants to to talk to me uh we can schedule remote office hours and just shoot me an email or message me on on campus um okay all this information should be in um in canvas but uh the breakdown for grading um there'll be uh class participation and then <clears throat> breakdown between uh homework and final projects uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about the final projects uh later on but you can already see uh some of the details there that are posted in Canvas um, in, in the files about what's gonna be required for the final project. It's basically just gonna be uh, a proposal, uh, class presentation, and then um, a final sort of project report. And again, that rubric is, is already um, posted in, in Canvas. Uh, all right, I'll pause here in case anyone has any quick questions. And if not, I have a question. Yeah. So would the slides be shared afterwards? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, okay. sorry, the way it works is, yeah, I'll I'll post all the slides um, onto Canvas uh, immediately after the, the lecture. Gotcha, thanks. Yep. Uh, okay, the... yep. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so, will the vid video recording of the uh, lectures be also available, or is that only be available for the remote sessions? Uh, so, yeah. So, the, the immediate plan is the recordings for the remote ones are going to be posted immediately. Um, it would uh, posting videos of the in-person ones starting on uh, lecture five um i don't currently have plans to do that um i think you know i was planning for it to be uh actually doing something like a a, a hybrid to accommodate anyone who wanted to do like remote but unfortunately 
the room that we were assigned has like no internet. So I, I'm not sure how I'd be able to set up doing that as, as of now for, um, at least. So yeah, we'll, we'll see kind of moving forward if folks are worried um, about attending in person, you know, with, with everything that's going on or if the university policy changes, I might try and figure something out. But um, for now, starting week three, we're just gonna, uh, we're just gonna do it in person without any like hybrid or, or recording. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. So let's go ahead and dive into it. So what is an energy system? So this is what we're going to be basically investigating in, um, in different ways throughout uh, this quarter. So all components related to production, conversion, delivery, and use of energy. So this is as defined by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, so this is covers a really sort of broad set of things. So we're going to today try and start at basics and, and break that down and sort of build our way up to the kind of full energy system. So for energy modeling, our goal is to understand um, both the energy consumption side of things and then importantly look at impacts uh, of that energy consumption in the system that we're interested in. And so here are just a couple examples of, of things um, that people try to measure. So things like technology adoption, okay, how fast are we, uh, adopting things like solar and wind or electric vehicles uh, and how can you do forecasts to figure out how much of the new technology is um, is getting adopted we're interested in fuel and energy consumption uh, how much energy is being used um, and of what type you know this answers a whole broad array of questions um, you might be concerned with things like resource adequacy, like how much more oil do we have in the future? Uh, issues of economics, thinking about cost and price. Um, and so hopefully folks are familiar with the, the differences there. It's, it'll be an important nuance. So like cost is things, expenses for like creating a product or um, expenses related to the services that a company sells and, and price is what people are you know, willing to pay or, or how much they pay for that product or service. Um, greenhouse gas emissions, this is a big one, obviously, for climate change, um, understanding things like CO2 or CO2 equivalents uh, emissions, and uh, ultimately uh, how that translates to um, impacts on the climate. And then the other sort of emissions that that is, um, I think, increasingly becoming a, a hotter topic these days, thinking about pollutant emissions, which are different, right? These are things that affect local populations um, and, and health outcomes of those exposed. So these are types of impacts that we would want to be understanding in our energy system modeling. Uh, and again, the sort of nice thing is you can already see that this spans a whole diversity of different disciplines. So engineering, economics, um, social sciences, social sciences. Okay. Uh, and then in the latter half of the course, I'd say probably the last two or three weeks, um, we'll be looking at uh, the role, <clears throat> the role of public policy um, in different scales and how they relate to a lot of the sort of energy and, and transportation systems that we'll be thinking about. Um, so how can you use policy to, or how can we inform policy, right, um, by quantifying differences in outcomes, um, as well as how policy can affect um, specific outcomes. Okay, so the course is broken down into about um, these these four rough modules. One 
we're, we'll be looking at um, a lot of uh, background, so understanding basic engineering and technology concepts. Uh, then we'll be delving into a lot of modeling tools, um, what sorts of analytical approaches are sort of most common in the field of systems modeling um, for energy and for transportation. Um, we'll look at uh, the types of models that are being used, um, how they measure certain things, and what uh, practical examples are there today for systems modeling. Uh, and then again, like I mentioned, we'll look at um, real world examples of policies where models are applied and have helped inform a lot of policy decisions. Okay. So we'll start off looking at energy production and consumption. Um, so the first thing going into this is uh, the different sorts of technologies and the fuels um, related to energy production. Um, so these are essentially your different types of um, uh, fuels, nuclear, coal, natural gas, uh, oil, um, yeah, it says gasoline, but I think oil is probably a, a, a broader term here. Uh, biomass and, and hydrogen. Um, so these, this set of fuels probably encompasses like the vast, vast majority of, um, of fuels that are uh, used for energy production to, to provide um, goods and services to, you know, the end users, us. Um, so we're gonna look at the properties of these fuels, economics, um, the resource um, resource attributes about that fuel. So how it's generated, how it's acquired, um, how much is, is out there in the world, and then implications related to how each of these fuels are being used. Uh, and then we'll look at the technologies related to turning those fuels ultimately into the services that we want. Um, so these are going to be things like power, power plants, um, engines, battery fuel cells, uh, getting a brief overview of how they work, uh, and then sort of larger systemic things like economics um, and implications of, of use. So moving on from here, uh, we go to um, the end use and, and services provided. So on the energy consumption side, uh, there's a whole set of uh, interesting questions to think about as well. Um, so when we think about this, the energy services that I was just talking about, um, oftentimes in, in a lot of these energy systems modeling, you're one of the sort of final things that you might get out of it, right, is, like kilowatt hours of electricity being used or, you know, therms of natural gas or gallons of gasoline. Um, but at the end of the day, people don't, uh, they're not really looking to get kilowatt hours of, of electricity, right? They want the services that are associated with them. And so, all right, can anyone provide some examples of, of energy services? Light and heat. Yes, light and heat. Perfect. Uh, anything else? Transportation. Yeah, yeah, mobility. Um, exactly. Air conditioning. Yep, cooling. So, so that's exactly right. So these 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 are the types of things, um, right? That that we actually want out of the electricity that that's being produced. Um, and oftentimes this kind of final step uh, in, in larger sort of system models might be um, glossed over, uh, but it's important to, to keep in mind um, that energy services aren't just uh, some unit of or quantity of electricity. It refers to you know, these ultimate uh, end services that, that you guys are, are providing examples of. Okay, and lastly, um, so we'll uh, think about um, 
there's this link between these energy efficiency um, between production and consumption uh, and this sort of characterizes the system that we're interested in, in looking at and as i mentioned before we want to look at um or the thing that that folks are usually most interested in examining are, are these associated impacts uh, of, of this system. And uh, of course, you can have policy that will influence um, both the impacts and, and the system itself. Last bit for the sort of overview, uh, there's a whole set of, of scale and resolution when we think about um, systems modeling uh, going down to sort of your unit level all the way up to sort of the whole uh, economic sector. And so we're going to sort of at the beginning of the course start small, get a sort of understanding of things that would uh, be more on the sort of unit or plant scale um, so that when you ultimately move to thinking about things on a systemic level that the things inside that that modeling system isn't like a total black box so i think it's important to have sort of fundamental understanding of a lot of those building blocks um, before you uh before you get to sort of the larger scale uh, models all right um before we sort of get into the the intro physics recap stuff, any questions uh, on any of the stuff that I just covered? Uh, right. I have a question. Yep. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, when we say uh, pollutant emissions, what exactly are we looking at? Yeah, so um, when you combust fossil fuels. Um, there are a whole bunch of things that um, that get emitted from from the combustion of, of, of a fuel. Uh, so we characterize those into sort of two separate categories. So one are things that lead to um, that lead to global warming, essentially. And so we know we, we call those things greenhouse gases. So things like carbon dioxide or methane, um, these are examples of things that will essentially sort of warm um, warm the, the earth uh, by sort of uh, trapping sunlight energy. Uh, and those emissions can get emitted from anywhere and uh, they will go up into the atmosphere and sort of linger around. Uh, another set of things that happen when you combust uh, a fossil fuel um, are, a, are sets of molecules like um, SOX or NOx, so NOx, SOx, um, and uh, what else is there? Carbon monoxide. Um, and, and there's a whole slew of these things that aren't actually contributing to greenhouse gas emissions, but uh, those emissions can can cause health damages to people who breathe those emissions um, in the sort of near vicinity of of where um, of where those emissions are happening. Oh yeah, so so Duncan also mentioned particulate matter. That's probably one of the more important ones for for health implications. Um, and and so we'll we'll talk about that a, a little bit. Um, as well in this in this class but the important thing is to sort of know that you've got basically these two sort of ca categories of emissions coming from combustion uh, and their sort of impacts are they're both pretty serious but they're the way in which they in, impact people are, are very different does that ho hopefully clarify this yes yeah, sure. thank you yep <laughs> Okay. Uh, anyone else? Uh, can we just go back to the diagram you had of the energy system just for like one second? Yeah, sure. Uh, oops. That one. Uh, this one. Yeah.
All right, that's good. Yep. Okay. So, like I said, we're going to start super basic. Um, usually, I found that in, in the past, you know, this course brings in a, a, a fairly broad spectrum of, of folks. Um, and, and so for the sort of engineers among you, some of this is going to be pretty, pretty simple, but, but hopefully, you know, there will still be some interesting things to, um, to learn here. <clears throat> so first concept, what is energy? <clears throat> so energy is the ability to perform work um, on, on, so that means you're sort of moving something from one place to another or, uh, or to heat an object. Uh, and there are a whole bunch of different forms of energy, kinetic, chemical, heat, electrical, electromagnetic, elastic, nuclear, gravitational. Uh, we're not gonna talk about all of these, um, although most of these are gonna, uh, we'll, we'll mention in, in, in some way or another. They're, they're all gonna be um, relevant. Uh, okay, so quick. Um, uh, sort of clarification for this concept. Um, so conservation of energy versus energy conservation, these are like two terms that are, you'll hear in, in this realm, um, in, in this sort of discipline that, that we're thinking about. They're, they're really sort of different concepts. Okay, so conservation of energy is a physics concept. Uh, which means that energy can't be created or destroyed. They're converted from one form to another. Um, and that's not to be confused with energy conservation, um, which is a sustainability concept um, that will probably be more prevalent in, in, um, in what we're talking about. Um, so this is reduction in energy usage to prevent wasting energy. Um, so this is uh, using less of something, so reducing the amount of service or activity that you're using, or uh, improving efficiency, right? Because that will in, um, reduce the amount of energy needed uh, to um, provide a, a, a good or service. Um, okay, so just make sure not to, to confuse those two. Um, Okay, another quick thing that I wanted to, to mention. So exergy, what is exergy? Um, so this is the maximum amount of work that can be derived from a particular system. I'm not sort of the biggest fan of this concept, but it is common enough that, um, that we should make sure that everyone knows what this is. Uh, it's, a, it's a measure of energy quality, essentially. Um, there's, we, we have this hierarchy of, of quality of energy because of the way uh, and the ease in which we can convert uh, one type of energy to another in order to do the final services that we're interested in. So this is like a pretty sort of qualitative measure in, in the sense that we, we val that we put value into energy types of energies in, in um, kind of subjective ways. Uh, so electricity is kind of your highest and then mechanical and those are both like a lot better than chemical and, and heat. Um, so energy is always conserved, but you can destroy exergy, right, by converting from one type of energy to another. Um, okay, and so if you, if you look at these sort of two comparative diagrams, these are providing, you know, the, the sort of same, um, uh, this is a, a diagram of the same sort of energy uh, starting point from primary to, um, to its end use, um, but this is measuring um, in terms of energy versus exergy. Uh, so this might be something like um, for a light bulb, uh, a whole bunch of it at the end comes out as heat. So this, this is gonna be more true for something like a old school incandescent light bulb. Uh, and so if we consider the energy of, of the light at the end as the, oh. the exergy, then 
yeah, you, you, you see something like this. Sorry, did someone have a question? No, okay. I have a <clears throat> I have a quick question. Yeah, sure. Um, you mentioned that electricity is more like in general has a better level of exergy than mechanical, and that they have more than or they're like a better situation than chemical and heat. Is that um, on average, or does it depend on like the system we're talking about? Like, is it just like a general rule that electricity is better than, say, chemical energy? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I guess the the kind of idea behind exergy is like, OK, if I were to, if I wanted to, prov to provide a sort of uh, any sort of generic service, um, the ability to translate in between types of uh, energy um, is a lot easier if you start with electricity to go to something like mechanical or chemical or heat than it is to go the sort of other way around. Um, so you always get much higher losses going from heat into chemical or mechanical or electricity compared to going from electricity into mechanical or into chemical or into heat. So, so now that um, we're trying to push to electrify buildings, um, say, I mean, thinking about a stove, um, that would be one of the other like benefits of, of doing that, right? We'd just <clears throat> making be making everything more energy efficient. Uh, yeah, although this is where I get into some some parts where I think as a concept, exergy isn't always the greatest thing because uh, at the end of the day, uh, you should you should tune the service provision to the specific, like uh, the best thing for that particular type of service. Um, so the push to electrify things, I think is, is well, I think it's kind of a separate concept from from exergy. It's more it's more in, in that you're getting like higher efficiency benefits from the sense of going from your primary to 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 your service um, in in some ways, although although in, in reality, actually some things are not actually as um, some things are not necessarily um, better in terms of efficiency, but they might be better in terms of like emissions, for example. Um, yeah, and, and so I, I think that that's probably a, a slightly separate concept. Thanks. Yep. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so talking about going back to energy, how is this measured? Um, so there are a whole bunch of different units of energy that, that you can talk about. Uh, so joules, watt hours, um, BTUs, uh, calories, and um, EVs, which I think is like electron volts. So uh, we'll talk about the sort of first four, um, the most relevant to the, the class are going to be uh, the, the first three. Um, the EV1 is more sort of like energy at an atomic level, and we won't talk about that at all. Um, OK, so Joule, this is sort of the gold standard for energy. This is the SI unit. Um, for energy, and it's used in a sort of wide variety of applications and in, in different fields. Um, so the strict definition of a one joule is that it can heat one gram of water by uh, 0.24 degrees Celsius um, at okay at one atmosphere. Sort of left out that detail. Or you can move one kilogram a distance of one meter um, with an acceleration of one. Um, uh, one meter second squared, one meter per second squared. Um, 
The next unit of energy is known as a watt hour. Um, so this is most commonly used in electricity. Um, so folks probably don't see this type of uh, meter anymore, but um, you, you probably have a different sort of meter connected to your house or your apartment. Uh, and, uh, and the way that meters report are, um, are in units of watt hours or, or kilowatt hours. Um, so the amount of energy used at a constant power rate over a period of time. So we haven't gone into power and talking about watts yet, um, but uh, when we get there, hopefully you can see how the units relate. Um, so one watt hour is equivalent to 3,600 uh, joules or 3.6 kilo kilojoules. Um, so consumption, again, of electricity at the residential level is often measured in kilowatt hours. This is a really common unit that we're gonna be using. Uh, and then when we talk about energy at other sorts of scales, if we're talking about things like power plants uh, or in sort of um, larger system use, thinking about um, energy slash electricity consumption, we might be talking about things in uh, megawatt hours, gigawatt hours, terawatt hours. Um, another common one that we'll talk about in energy systems is BTUs, which are no, also known as uh, British thermal units. Um, so this is really common in um, getting the energy content of fuels. Uh, so this, uh, a BTU is the amount of energy used to raise the temperature of one pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. So it's kind of similar um to uh, joules in that regard but you can think of it in, in terms of imperial metrics uh one btu is pretty close to uh, a thousand joules uh so oftentimes there's like a easy way to substitute between uh joules um and, and btus uh and so the most common uh, use of BTUs uh, as a unit is to measure energy content of like natural gas. Uh, so this fuel, um, when we talk about uh, MMBTUs, that's a million BTUs. Um, so a thousand cubic feet of natural gas is approximately uh, one million BTUs or about one gigajoule. That's the energy content of, of that fuel. Uh, and then in terms of um, another sort of abbreviation is therms, uh, which is 100,000 BTUs. So 100 cubic feet is one uh, is about one therm of, of energy content. Um, and then when we think about larger scale systems, um, especially for like economy-wide sectors, uh, oftentimes um, for countries that use imperial metrics, we'll talk about this uh, unit called a quad, which is 10 to the 15th BTUs or uh, quadrillion BTUs. So this is used in the United States to represent, for example, the annual energy consumption of the country. Uh, okay, last one. So we're not going to be talking about this in the um, in, in this class that much, but um, another sort of common one, probably one of the more common ones that um, the general public uh, will experience is a unit um, called a calorie. So this is commonly used for energy content in foods. Um, it's similar to BTU, but in metric. So it's the energy required to raise um, the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius at one atmosphere. <clears throat> so one calorie is about 4.2 joules. Um, and then one important thing to note is that the calories that you see on like food labels are actually thousands of calories. So these are kilocalories. Um, makes things somewhat confusing. 
that it's not labeled that way, but there you go. Okay, so we're gonna do a quick sort of, uh, uh, not a quiz type thing, but we'll, we'll, we'll see what, uh, what people will, will guess here um, as a way to kind of get some perspective about uh, all these different types of um, energy units that we talked about and, and how we can sort of quantify um, uh, energy uh, amounts for sort of, sort of different um, uses and, and types of things. So, so go ahead and uh, actually, if, if folks want to guess here, we can we can go through these um, kind of one by one. Uh, let me see. Do I have this set up? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, can anyone give guess in terms of like orders of magnitude? So you know. Uh, one to 10, 10 to 100, 100 to 1,000, whatever unit, <clears throat> uh, how much energy content is in like a typical like meal? Uh, okay, so I already see, yeah, you can, you can type in chat. Um, so average meal, 500 calories, 1,000 calories. So, so we're guessing between 100 and 1,000, um, but remember calories are <clears throat> kilocalories, right? So. Uh, that's right. So 100 to 1,000 kilocalories. So 100 to 1,000 kilojoules. Okay. Uh, how much energy? What, what do you What do you guys think in terms of the energy content of like an average person? Do you mean how much energy an average person uses a day? Or uh, actually, I was thinking like. Oh, okay. If we, it, if we use it for energy. Yeah, I guess that's kind of crude. If you like put a, a person into like a bomb calorimeter and you tried to measure how much energy you could get out of it. Uh, okay, I see a guess. 10,000 to 100,000 kilocalories. Uh, all right, let's take a look. So 100 to 1,000 megajoules. Uh, so the guess was 10 to 100,000 kilocalories. Which would be, uh, which would be ten to hundred thousand kilojoules, uh, so ten to hundred. So it's about ten times higher than than you were guessing, Duncan. Uh, okay, but so let's let's try and get more a little more relevant here. Okay, so we've got a lump of coal here. Let's say it's like a kilogram of coal. Um, so in in you know, in case anyone got some in, in, in their, you know, stockings uh, this Christmas. Um, how much energy do you guys think would be in this, this lump of coal here if we were to burn it? Um, okay, I see a guess, 30 megajoules. Okay, so we'll say like 10 to 100. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, yeah, uh, and then let's say a gallon of gasoline. Anyone want to guess here? 100, 250. Okay, so we're saying 100 to 1,000 ish. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's that, that's right. So it's 100,000 BTUs, which is about 100 uh, megajoules. Uh, okay, um, solar energy. So I think uh, in, in the slide before I said, what's the energy that you would get if you shine sunlight onto a patch of land, uh, one square meter for one hour? Um, how much energy would that be? Uh, okay, I see one kilowatt hour, uh, 1.5 kilowatt hours. Um, yeah, uh, that's right. So um, in terms of uh, energy, so let me uh, go from that to, to uh, joules. So that's 3.6 um, kilojoules per uh, watt hour. So yeah, that's exactly right. So you'd be on the order of one to 10 megajoules. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and just, you know, to, to give you some 
perspective, right? So thinking about uh, the, the amount of energy for that, um, uh, for solar to equate to like a kilogram of coal or a gallon of gasoline, you can think about, you know, how, how, um, how much land or, or how long you would need to have uh, essentially that amount of sunshine um, to translate into the sort of equivalent amount of energy <clears throat> for other uh, forms of energy, such as coal or gas. Uh, okay, so uh, what about electric vehicles? Um, so thinking about, uh, you know, all the electric vehicles that are <clears throat> on the market now or are going to be coming out in, in the near future. Uh, okay, so we've got uh, 30 kilowatt hours um, for 100 miles. Uh, yeah, 100 kilowatt hours. Yeah, so we're thinking on the order of, you know, 10 to 100 kilowatt hours. I know there's some cars that even have more than that now. Uh, and so that's going to be between 100 to 1,000 <clears throat> megajoules. You can think about that in relation to uh, like gallons of gasoline, right? You, you'd want to, at the end of the day, try and get a similar type of range. So on the order of, you know, 10, 10 gallons of gas for like an average sedan. So you're, you're, you're getting to that sort of level of energy in a, in a typical electric vehicle battery. Um, okay, so then the next one, we've got uh, a house here. Um, so how much energy would a typical household use, uh, let's say in the US uh, over the course of, of one day? Yeah, so one to 10 megajoules in a day. Um, it's actually gonna be a little bit higher. Yeah, 100 kilowatt hours um, would, would be kind of like on the much higher end. Um, but just to give kind of some, some ranges here, uh, 100 to 1,000 megajoules. Um, OK, so there's a lot of sort of en energy literate folk here. So you guys have done a good job guessing here. Um, but can anyone guess the amount of energy for a nuclear explosion? Thousand quads. Okay. Um, I don't even, actually even know how you how I translate to it to a quad, but uh, ten to a hundred petajoules, so a, a, a lot more than a than a, than a terajoule. Um, you know, so that's like ten times ten to the ninth uh, megajoule. So you can power. It's like the equivalent of being able to power. Uh, you know, I think. Uh, okay, 10 to the ninth, so 10 to the eight, like 10 million houses uh, for a day. Uh, a lot of energy there. Um, okay, and then uh, thinking about terms of sort of energy economies. So this, uh, we'll be thinking about energy in these magnitudes, especially at sort of the larger system modeling scales. Um, so in the US, uh, the annual consumption is about 100 quads or 100 exajoules. Um, and then for the entire world, you're talking about, um, uh, so the rest of the world doesn't use um, imperial, so we're going to say in terms of uh, 100,000 terawatt hours, um, uh, which is a, a uh, 100 to 1,000 sort of range uh, um, in terms of exajoules. Okay, good. So you know this is we're we're, we're for for those who are maybe a, a little bit less familiar with working with these sorts of units. We just want to get folks comfortable and, and start to uh, introduce familiarity with kind of ranges of energy content, so you get a sense of. Um, you know, as we as we talk a lot more about 
you know, fuels and energy and technologies, we're going to be using uh, these units a lot. And so kind of just to get familiar um, with relative quantities of, of energy here. Um, okay, and so diving back to the US, um, this is to give a sense of uh, breakdown of energy consumption by energy source. Again, we're just trying to inject some familiarity um, in terms of energy types and, and quantities. So as I mentioned before, um, the US uses about 100 quads of energy. Um, uh, and so this is 100 um, 0.2 quadrillion BTUs. Uh, and the breakdown here, you can see the vast majority is going to be uh, in, in fossil fuel use. So that's going to be your, your coal, your petroleum, and your natural gas. Um, and that accounts for uh, something like 80% or so, uh, probably a little bit less now. No, no 80%, or around 80% of, of all of the, the energy usage. Um, in, in 2019. Uh, and the rest of it is coming from sources like nuclear power, which is going to be exclusive to um, electricity generation, and then renewable energy. Um, so you can see the breakdown, they zoom in here for that 11%. Um, most of our renewables are coming from uh, hydro. Um, although wind has, well, actually wind is, is bigger than, than, than hydro now. Um, it's, it, it, it has grown pretty rapidly over the last sort of two decades. Um, and you can see kind of relatively where uh, other, other sources are like, like, like solar. Um, yeah, and so a lot of this is gonna be uh, going into electricity production, um, although things like petroleum is gonna be going into um, you know, powering transportation. Okay, so before we dive into um, power, are there any questions about, about this? All right, so moving right along. <coughs> uh, so power is the rate of doing work, um, or you can think of it as just sort of energy divided by time. Um, so the two common forms of power that we'll be talking about um, in the class are watts and horsepower. So watts uh, is the SI unit for power. It's equal to one joule per second. So if you uh, think about um, the energy concept that we were just talking about, watts refers to the amount of uh, energy that can, can be produced in a set unit of, of time. Um, and so going back to the, the particular energy unit, uh, watt hours, um, it is simply canceling out the denominator of time by multiplying by an, an hour, so that gets backed into, that's how you translate back into your unit of, of joules. Um, so commonly used in electricity to describe, so uh, capacity of like a power plant. Um, <clears throat> so when we say a power plant has an installed capacity of 10 megawatts, it means that that power plant can physically produce up to 10 megawatts of instantaneous power, okay? And so if a 10 megawatt uh, power plant is producing at 100% capacity for one hour, um, that power plant would have produced uh, 10 megawatt hours of energy um, at a rate of 10 megawatts. Okay, uh, the other unit of horsepower, uh, or sorry, the other unit of power is horsepower. Uh, so this is K 
commonly used to describe power for engines and other sorts of mechanical power. Um, so one horsepower can lift one kilogram, one meter in one second. Um, it, although it's again, this is kind of kind of silly, but you've got different units of horsepower between imperial and, and metric. Um, so one imperial unit of horsepower is about 745 watts, and one metric unit of horsepower is 735. I don't know why they're different, but just uh, you know, keep the, those numbers in, in mind. Uh, does anyone know? what the horsepower of one horse is? Let's find out. Yeah, it's actually about 15 horsepower. So it um, doesn't even refer necessarily to uh, horses. <laughs> kind of silly. Um, OK, so why don't we do the same sort of exercise here? Um, you can kind of try and guess uh, guess at uh, the ranges of, of these things. Um, okay, let me see here. Okay, so light bulb. Hopefully, most folks have a sense of this. Yeah. Um, so I'm getting a lot of you know ten to a hundred watts. Um, so that that is uh, uh, that that's right. Uh, although I would say you know a decade ago, it's much more common to be in the sort of hundred to three hundred watt range. Um, but actually, we uh, we have transitioned away from incandescent light bulbs. Um, and actually, that's that's a great example of, of uh, public policy uh, sort of really sort of leading the charge on that. Actually, during the Obama administration, um, there was essentially a ban on production of in, incandescent um, light bulbs, which led to this rapid shift to CFLs and LEDs, which are way, way, way more efficient. Um, and, and actually, it's, it's kind of just a win-win situation because you end up saving a lot more money for the, the sort of lifetime of, of owning that uh, a, a light bulb. And so these days, you're actually probably more on the order of, you know, one to, to 10 watts than you are from sort of 10 to, to 100. Um, so I, I, I probably even should, should update this, this slide. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right, uh, Duncan. So, so Trump reversed it. Although by then it's it's too late. No one buys incandescent light bulbs anymore. Like everyone knows that that there are a lot more sort of savings for uh, for uh, LEDs. Um, so, so that that's an instance where, uh, yeah, I think the the economics uh, makes. Um, makes sort of natural sense to transition. So, so people have not reverted to, to using incandescent light bulbs. Uh, okay. Uh, what is um, the power output of, say, uh, a typical uh, human who's exercising? Yep, okay. Um, that's right. So 50 uh, to 150 watts is going to be the range, depending on, on how um, uh, how active you, you, you're being. Um, yeah, so, you know, 10, let's say 10 to 1,000 uh, watts, if we wanted to do our sort of rough orders of, of magnitude. Um, there's a... Uh, there's some there's some cool videos of, of uh, some you can look up of some athletes trying to like power um, like a toaster and which is like 300 watts or something and, and, and you can see how how extremely difficult it is to do something like that. Uh, okay, uh, microwave 
Anyone have any ideas? Yep. So about a thousand watts is your typical typical microwave. Um, okay. Uh, how about a sort of rooftop solar system? Um, uh, what's the sort of range of uh, uh, of power production uh, that you would see like during during the day, during an, an average uh, say summer day? Yep. So we're talking on the order of sort of one to one to ten uh, kilowatts um, for for a uh, single panel. You're on the order of um, three hundred watts. Um, so okay, this is the this is a sort of bad um, bad picture because apparently I, I wrote it for a sort of a utility scale. But for a rooftop, you get that's you guys are right. Um, you're you're on the order of maybe uh, one to ten uh, kilowatts. There's maybe if you have a really really big group, you could get uh, big, bigger than that. Um, uh, okay, next up for a um, for a average house, how much power does it use? So you could actually maybe try and and work backwards um, from the energy one uh, that we were talking about. Uh, but yeah, in the US, the average household is about one kilowatt. Uh, and, and that's where we got our, our number from before. Um, okay, uh, how about an engine? Any guesses? You can guess in terms of horsepower as well. You don't need to translate. Okay, uh, two to 10 horsepower, that's probably gonna be a little bit low for an engine, um, 100 kilowatts. Uh, yeah, that's right. So uh, you're on the order of on like hundreds of, of horsepower. You know, if you spend a couple hundred thousand dollars, you could probably get a upwards of a thousand horsepower. Um, but that, again, that, that's gonna translate uh, 100 to a thousand kilowatts. Yeah, thousand horsepower is a bit much, although there are cars that do have a thousand horsepower. Um, so, uh, let's see. Oop, I accidentally uh, uh, clicked forward. Um, but okay, wind turbines. Uh, you get on the order of uh, of a megawatt for. Um, a single sort of typical large turbine uh, these days, although there are some really sort of really, really big ones. Um, and and we'll, we'll, we'll see some examples of these um, that can get upwards of. Uh, actually, these days, uh, there I think there are five megawatt um, offshore wind turbines that exist now. Um, and then for an entire sort of wind farm, uh, you're talking about on the order of hundreds to thousands uh, of megawatts. Uh, okay, so next up we have a natural gas plant. Um, anyone wanna venture a guess to um, ranges of power production for these guys? One to 10 gigawatts. 100 to 500 megawatts. Yeah, so, so, uh, yeah, pretty far on a, these are um, gonna be more, more accurate. So really small ones might be on, you know, could be smaller than, than 100 megawatts uh, all the way up to maybe a gigawatt. Um, although that would be, Awfully big for for a natural gas plant. So typically, you're you're sort of in the range of like a couple hundred uh, megawatts. Um, for a natural gas plant, you're not going to get much larger than that. There there probably are a handful of examples where you're getting these really sort of large scale ones, but um, 
usually natural gas plants aren't going to be uh, as big uh, as you know the largest coal or or nuclear plants. Um, okay, and so maybe that gives it away a little bit, but um, so coal plants uh, similar, uh, but but are going to be sort of on on average uh, larger than your natural gas plants. So. Um, and, and for these cases, you're going to be sort of uh, not not too uncommonly on the order of several gigawatts um, for coal plants. Um, and then for nuclear plants, you know, right, so we're going with kind of small, medium, large uh, nuclear plants aren't going to be much smaller than <clears throat> than a gigawatt. Uh, and uh, when we talk about some of the sort of specific nuances of, of how these power plants operate, we'll get a sense of, of why this is. But, you know, for now, uh, just sort of have it um, in your head that nuclear plants are going to be operating sort of <coughs> uh, at, at much higher power uh, on, on average than, than these, these other two. Oh yeah, so um, so Francisco is asking this question. So why do coal plants tend to be larger than natural gas plants? Uh, it is a combination of um, on the sort of engineering side, um, sort of operational requirements of of coal plants, and then yes, uh, there are economics that kind of favor sort of larger build outs of of coal plants than than natural gas plants. Um, uh, it's you can you can almost actually think of it that uh, that bigger isn't necessarily better. There's a lot of flexibility uh, that natural gas plants are afforded in being able to size to uh, sort of smaller units um, for certain types of uses, whereas coal plants really can't do that. Um, the way that they operate are through um, combustion that heat um, these boilers. And so there's there are sort of operational constraints that kind of dictate that they naturally have to be larger, whereas natural gas plants just don't really have those same kind of constraints. Um, and so, yeah, exactly. So as, as Duncan's saying, that the turbines associated with natural gas plants can be um, way smaller uh, than, than, than in coal plants. So they have a lot more sort of flexibility. Um, okay, so what about, uh, let's say, does anyone have a sense of, if we're thinking about the average amount of power uh, um, used by sort of the state of, of California? So actually I'm thinking about, um, let's, let's be more specific about uh, electricity consumption by the state of California. Okay, uh, we have a uh, hundred gigawatts. Yep, uh, fifty gigawatts. That's right. So uh, the the sort of peak power in California is about fifty gigawatts. So we're operating again in the order range uh, magnitude of of uh, ten to hundred. Um, the sort of average daytime. Uh, uh, daytime peak like throughout the year is going to be more on the order of like 30 gigawatts uh so we're we're usually in the 20 to 30 gigawatt uh range for, for california uh okay and then any guesses for power um average power for the entire world um Actually, what I think what I have here is total installed capacity. Um, so this isn't actually usage. Um, but if I were to add up all of the power plants uh, and then you turn them all on to a maximum, uh, you are on the order of 15,000 gigawatts or about uh, 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 15, 15 terawatts. Um, okay, good. So 
I'm so typically when we do remote, I, I try and take a little bit of a break after the hour. We're, we're a little bit over, but we'll, we'll do that now. Um, so let's take a quick five minute break. Uh, and we'll reconvene at 1113. And in the meantime, I'll stay here. And if anyone uh, has any questions or wants to chat about anything, um, now's, a, now's a good time. Did you say 1115? Uh, 1113, just five okay. minutes. Yep. Okay. <clears throat>
All right. Hopefully everyone is refreshed and ready again. So we'll continue onwards now. Um, okay. So the last bit today is, uh, is gonna be talking about energy efficiency. Um, so energy efficiency is a concept where we try to reduce the amount of energy required to provide um, particular products and services. Um, okay, so there's this idea, you have this kind of first law of thermal efficiency. Um, so our, our definition of efficiency we think about the amount of work or energy that you can get out of a particular process uh, compared to the amount of energy required to go into that process. Um, so in this case, um, if I look at energy output versus energy input, uh, if I want to, for example, create uh, from a starting point of um, uh, corn into biofuels. So I start with 100 kilograms of corn, um, and then I get 11 gallons of ethanol output. Uh, we can get a sense of how uh, efficient this process is by looking at um, our input energy, which is energy content of this 100 kilograms of, of corn. Um, so if you've got uh, 18 megajoules per kilogram, then the energy content of this 100 kilograms of corn is about 1800 megajoules. And then I can measure um, the energy content of 11 gallons of ethanol. So that's 89 megajoules per gallon, and I get 979 megajoules. Okay, so then I end up with the stuff that has uh, about 980 megajoules um, of energy in it. Um, and I started with 1800. Uh, and so you get uh, a 54% efficiency. And, and so that, that means in the process of converting the corn into ethanol, you're, you're losing some energy, right? Through, um, for example, like heat that's getting lost in the, in the chemical um, process. Uh, okay, it doesn't always have to be in terms of, of energy, right? You can think of, um, you know, efficiency for uh, like a pipeline, for example. So, you know, if you have 100 gallons at the start and you get 95 gallons out, and you, you know, lost five gallons through like leakage or something, right? Then you could say, okay, the pipeline is like 95% uh, uh, efficient. Um, and then we can think of it in terms of um, uh, power as well. So efficiency um, for this light bulb, um, if you have 60 watts of electricity input and you get 3.1 watts of light energy output, um, then you get 6% uh, efficiency with the remaining amount of uh, energy being lost as heat, for example, in, in, in this particular case. Um, okay, so one thing to sort of clarify, um, and and this is kind of a, a, a misnomer that will will be. Um, that, that we'll be doing in, in, in this course and, and generally in the field of, of energy, this, this, um, this happens a lot, but sort of properly speaking, there is a sort of difference between the terms of efficiency versus efficacy. Um, so when we think of uh, energy efficiency, uh, this is strictly speaking a dimensionless number and it has to be less than one, right? Because it's 
proportion of your, your starting amount. Um, so your units of your numerator are always the same as the units of your denominator. And so you, because of um, uh, the conservation of energy uh, rule, right, you can never end up with more energy than you started with. Um, and, and so your efficiency number can never be larger than one. Um, there's another uh, term that, that uh, or there are other terms that we call efficiency, um, where the ratio of the output to input, um, uh, so the numerator and denominator, sorry, don't always have the same unit, right? And so, for example, if I were to ask you, okay, how efficient is your car? Uh, you might say something like, oh, it's, you know, 30 miles per gallon, right? Um, so that is a uh, commonly, uh, we, we think of, we think of this at, uh, commonly in terms of uh, efficiency, but the actual term here is, is efficacy, where you may have a different um, unit for your denominators and numerators, and therefore you could end up with numbers that are like larger than one, right? So for example, that the 30 miles per gallon, that would be uh, larger than one, an example of, of efficacy. So we're, we're not going to get really sort of hung up on, on, on this um, idea of like properly using a, a efficiency. Um, just know that there, there is kind of like a um, strictly speaking, uh, a, a difference between between these two terms, but we will be using them sort of interchangeably um, in, in this class. Uh, okay, any any questions or confusions here? Just to clarify, so in the case of the car, <clears throat> uh, let's say, I mean, you gave the example of we normally say like 30 miles per gallon or something like that, but uh, the what you're saying in terms of efficiency would be more of some of something like uh, we put, I don't know, a uh, hundred kilojoules. I don't know how much a car uses, a hundred kilojoules. Yeah, sure. we get 80 kilojoules out. So 80 over a hundred would give us a number less than one. And yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but one of the reasons why we would think about something like miles per gallon, right, is that we care. This goes back to this idea that, like, we care most about the service that we're receiving from using that energy, and not so much about like the strict term of efficiency, right? And so. I care a lot more that I, I care a lot more in being able to quantify, uh, you know, how far my car can travel, uh, given some amount of fuel input, more than I do, um, like the amount of energy that comes out of my engine from the fuel being combusted into it. Right. So, so I could say, okay, my my vehicle engine is strictly speaking like 19% efficient um, at its peak because you know I can measure the energy content of the sort of fuel going in and then I can measure the like mechanical energy that's that's being produced and seeing the sort of difference right and, and that's that is a thing that people measure um, but we want to be able to to look at um, other forms of, of service outputs. And, and that's where you start to stray away from the ability to do strict, like um, these strictly energy efficiency dimensionless numbers. Um, yeah. Uh, and and it, 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 <laughs> if, you, if you translate back to this energy efficiency thing, it, it, gets, a, it gets a little weird. I, I put a link here if people are interested in, in, in th thinking about this. Um, uh, there's a there, there's a funny example of like an MPG and what that actually means because uh, miles is a unit of length um, and then gallons is a unit of uh, is a unit of 
vol volume. So you can translate that into like meters cubed, for example. So you have meters over meters cubed. So you end up with one over meters squared. So if you convert that number into this per length squared, what does that number, what does like 30 MPG actually represent? And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let anyone who's interested kind of kind of dive into that. It's pretty funny. Um, oh, actually, let me go back here. So, um, OK, why, why is energy, why do we care about energy efficiency? Um, so when we think about sustainability concepts and like reducing energy use, um, we, we want to do that because, uh, because all the issues associated with, with using um, uh, uh, energy. Um, and, and so that those are impacts that are like climate change, for example. Um, and improvements in energy efficiency are, are, use, are particularly useful to think about because it doesn't require, it doesn't necessarily require people to change their behavior um, to, uh, to behave in certain ways or to like conserve energy, right? You can have the same amount of service um, with a, a smaller amount of upstream energy usage if you improve energy efficiency. And so oftentimes we think of these as like the sort of low hanging fruit. And one of the like, uh, unlike things like, for example, like, a, like an electric vehicle, right? Which, you know, I'm, I'll be the first one to say I'm, I'm like a big advocate of, but there are trade-offs between doing, you know, having, going from a gas car to electric car. Right now it's more, uh, it's more expensive up front. And then there are some kind of behavioral things that related to refueling and even to, to traveling, right? Um, but there are imp improvements in energy efficiency means that you don't have to sacrifice necessarily in, in, in a lot of those things. And so one of the sort of gold standard examples of this, where you can always get this sort of win-win situation where it's both cheaper for the customer and less expensive um, is actually uh, refrigerators. And so if, if, if all products could, could kind of follow this, the success story, I think we'd have a much easier uh, time um, sort of doing uh, energy, energy savings. Um, and, and so this is an example of, um, if, you, if you look at this chart, uh, improvements in refrigerators, let them get bigger, which means you get more right end service essentially. Uh, they got cheaper, which means you're saving money and the energy consumption um, uh, went down, and so this is this is like kind of the ideal success sort of story that we would want for all of our sort of products um, and, and services to to improve uh, energy efficiency in, in, in this way. Okay. Um, and so the concept of energy efficiency is related to um, these sort of energy pathways in which we transition from one type of energy to the final service energy, and we, we want to try and reduce the amount of energy being used as we go through these pathways. Um, so we have primary energy. Um, so these are naturally occurring resources. Okay, and so this is the most sort of important thing to remember about primary energy is that um, without sort of any processing, we are able to um, uh, collect and, and extract this from the environment. From the environment. Okay, that, okay, that's I guess that's a that's a form of, of processing, but they're not uh, necessarily you know modified into other types of um, carriers. So crude oil, natural gas, coal, solar, wind, geothermal, tidal energy, these are all examples of um, primary energy.
energy that we kind of collect directly from uh, the environment. Um, the, some of these resources can then be processed and modified to become uh, a different sort of energy character. So, so this is secondary energy. So for example, um, gasoline, uh, petroleum, uh, these are this is an example of a secondary energy that's refined from crude oil. Uh, other examples would be electricity, which we derive from the combustion of things like natural gas or coal. Um, yeah, and so, so secondary energy, next step from sort of the, the direct uh, fuel source collected from the environment. And then the sort of final delivered energy is energy or carriers or energy carriers or fuels that are used directly in that final energy appliance. Okay, and so this is like the electricity that goes into your house um, or the gasoline or diesel at the gas station. Um, so, so you might notice, for example, that like electricity is both a secondary energy and a final slash delivered energy. But there, there are some reasons why, in, in some cases, you want you would want to show this explicitly. For example, uh, electricity, right, produced at the power plant, uh, has to uh, step up in voltage, get transferred across transmission lines, step down in voltage, go across distribution lines, uh, and then before it, it, it arrives at your house. And so you're gonna experience some losses. And so we can keep track of that um, in these energy pathways as you go from like secondary uh, energy electricity to final um, delivered energy slash electricity. Um, okay, and then that final energy is then converted into our useful energy to provide those um, services that we've been kind of talking about throughout the, the lecture. So heating, cooling, lighting, mobility. Um, so these types of energy pathways diagram is really sort of common in, in, these, in these fields. Um, so we saw an example of one earlier, but generally the way these, um, these are shown uh, as you, you sort of have your largest bar at the start. Um, and, and so these are your primary energy sources. And then through sort of transfer, transformation, as you go from primary to secondary to the to final, um, you are transforming your, your energy um, in, in different types um, or, or fuels. And what you'll see is, um, sort of losses happening uh, and, and these sort of get smaller and smaller before you get to the sort of final useful energy or, or um, services, right? And so um, this is kind of a nice diagram that shows uh, a generic version of these, um, uh, of, of these types of diagrams that we'll be seeing a lot. Um, okay, so when we think about um, energy efficiency, right there, let's let's take the example of um, of your uh, light bulb. Okay, and so there are a whole bunch of processes that go from your primary energy to the electricity going into that light bulb and then even that light bulb sort of pro, um, providing uh, sort of the, the, the useful service. And so when we think about improving efficiency or efficacy of any particular part of that entire pathway going from say like a coal plant producing electricity to the electricity um, needed by your, your light bulb, we can think about, okay, where does it make the most sense to improve the efficiency? And um, this, there are pros and cons to improvements of, of sort of different parts of that pathway. So if we were to say improvements in the final or service efficiency, um, so this would be like, let's say, let, let me switch from like an incandescent light bulb to an LED. 
Um, okay, so there are some benefits here, right? So it reduces the amount of energy needed at every single upstream stage. Um, and so that propagation actually leads to a lot larger quantity of uh, energy savings. Um, and so that affects everything from right less mining, oil extraction, fewer power plants, um, all along that that pathway chain. And, and we're going to show an example of this to make it a little bit more explicit. Um, and so from a strictly like quantitative uh, measure, improvements in the final to service efficiency is like the best thing that you can do um, because any improvements there are sort of multiplied throughout the chain. Um, and so why would we ever want to say improve the power plant as opposed to improving the, the light bulbs? Um, so there are some good reasons for this, right? So these can be, it's easier to centrally implement. Um, and, and so you would only need to affect like one power plant as opposed to say getting a thousand different people to improve their their light bulbs, right? Um, and the the other thing is from a behavioral perspective, um, it's easier to sort of treat them as rational economic actors, um, like larger companies or corporations compared to sort of individual consumers. So oftentimes. Not always, but oftentimes it's easier to go upstream to improve efficiency than sort of downstream. And again, we're going to look sort of explicitly an example of this um, right at the end. Uh, okay, so how do I measure the efficiency of a system uh, or the life cycle energy efficiency? So, uh, you know, you might. Think about okay, what's the efficiency of my final light bulb? What's the efficiency of the you know distribution lines carrying the electricity? What's the efficiency of the transmission lines carrying the efficiency uh, or carrying the electricity? What's the efficiency of like the coal plant producing the electricity? How do I get the whole sort of uh, system energy efficiency? So it's actually pretty simple. All you have to do is multiply those efficiencies together. Um, so this is kind of like your mathematical expression for doing that. I'll kind of leave that as a reference, but um, again, it's, it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, so this is an example um, of uh, different pathways. So if I look at um, if I look at the first pathway, this might be. Uh, starting from coal all the way to um, getting electricity being used in a manufacturing plant. And if I started at one unit of energy uh, on the primary energy side, and then it ends up using 0.18 um, units of, of energy at the end, I can write do the input divided by output and I get a pathway efficiency of 18%. And I could, I could, um, I could calculate the efficiency at every step, right? I could say, okay, this is my um, output energy and the input is 0.25. So the energy efficiency of final to useful would be 0.18 divided by 0.25. Um, and that would give you the efficiency of this step. And then you could do that for, and uh, you could do that for each of these and determine the energy efficiencies. And if you multiplied all of those efficiencies together, you would end up with 18%. Uh, and you can see a couple different sort of pathway efficiencies. Um, so this is natural gas um, being used uh, to produce electricity being used in a, in a residential building. Um, and then this is crude oil uh, being used um, in, in your sort of light duty vehicle. Uh, you can see, for example, here, like the biggest drop off is, is actually in, in the engine, um, but the whole sort of pathway uh, is 12% is, you know, efficient in terms of um, 
uh, energy efficiency. Okay, uh, any questions about this or confusion? Uh, okay, so there's a question. What, where is the energy loss from output of coal processing to input of coal? Um, uh, so I think you're talking about these two boxes. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, those two boxes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's probably just material loss. So uh, coal processing, the way this, this happens is uh, coal gets dumped from your, um, so the a common example is, okay, the, the coal gets mined, it gets dumped into these train carts, which go to a power plant, and then they open, the, the carts open up and they fall out of the, the, the bottom of the, the train cart into these hoppers that then crush up the coal into like fine uh, sort of particulate or not particulate it's like fine coal dust that that, that that gets that then gets shunted into um uh the combustion chamber and so this might actually just be uh material loss where you know some of the some of the like dust blows away or you know any any process in in the crushing of the coal you're you're losing a little bit of material um that's I, I think that's likely where where you're losing some in the, in the coal processing. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, okay, so one of the things that you might have heard um is that electric vehicles are like way more efficient than gasoline vehicles um which technically is true right so uh if i like if i take the energy content of the uh battery uh and i compare it to the electricity kind of going um uh into the the motor uh, into the motors or i measure the mechanical energy um that you get out of propel propelling the vehicle um if you compare that to uh, uh if you compare that to the fuel content of your gasoline going into the engine uh and then the energy that you're getting derived from the engine performing work uh, the electric vehicle is going to be like way more efficient, um, and and you can you can see that uh, you can see that here, right? So the this this gas number compared to your um, your uh, energy um, actually it should be yeah it, compared to the the to the efficiency from the electric vehicles. Um, that is true, but it's, well, okay, to me, I, I think that's kind of a, a, a false comparison because like essentially what you're comparing um, is the sort of gasoline compared to, to the battery. But actually, if we think of the whole sort of life cycle, it's, um, it's a little bit closer. Right, because instead of combusting the fuel in the engine, you're combusting primary fuel at a power plant upstream. And then for that comparison, you can actually see um, uh, going from 8.3 to one versus 10.1 or 9.7 uh, to, to one. And so in this particular example, right, um, with with these numbers, it actually ends up uh, being slightly less efficient in in terms of energy efficiency um, going from your primary fuel source to your final um, uh, 
your your final energy because you end up using less um, primary energy um, than than in your electric vehicle examples. Um, that's 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 probably not um, quite true everywhere, and right, it doesn't all have to come from coal and natural gas, and it depends on on the numbers here. But the the general idea, right, is that um, I I typically think it's a sort of better, more fair comparison if you look at sort of the sort of life cycle uh, efficiency of, of the vehicles um, compared to to just looking at sort of the, the endpoints. Okay. So moving on, so as sort of the last example here, I'm going to kind of revisit this idea about, um, so now that we have a sense of understanding sort of the system, um, system energy efficiency, we'll go back to this idea of improvements in efficiency um, and how selecting particular um, points to improve the efficiency can have really different um, systemic impacts in uh, in this pathway that we're looking at. Okay, so again, uh, this diagram is showing um, the production of sort of one unit of useful light energy. Okay, that's what we want out of the system is one unit of, of this light energy. And we are starting with, you know, some amount of primary energy, uh, so here we're going to do 320 um, units of primary energy coming from gas or coal generation going down to one that we ultimately want. And we can see the losses corresponding to each of these phases. So if I'm, if I'm producing uh, if through generation, transmission, distribution, right? So the most of the losses are coming from the combustion of the fuel, which is in your generation side, and then um, transportation of the elect electricity from the power plant to you is gonna result in a little bit of losses, um, but not a huge amount, right? So 5% each. Um, and then most of it is gonna be lost uh, here. Um, 98% uh, in, in heat losses. Okay, and so let's compare sort of two improvements of energy efficiency. Okay, so let's say we were to improve the power plant uh, efficiency. Um, Okay, so get to one unit of useful energy. So the number that we're changing here is 50%. Okay, and so all of these numbers, 1, 1, 2, 100, 101, 106, these all stay the same, right? So if I go back one slide, you can see um, up, to, up to the generation point, you're, you're looking at the same numbers. Um, but because I've improved the efficiency of the generation, my losses are only 50%, which means I only need to start with 224 uh, units of um, primary energy compared to 320, right, in, in, in the past. And so as I improve my power plant from 35% to 50% efficiency, um, then you end up with a 30% reduction in the total amount of starting primary energy. Okay, so let's, so this is a 15% improvement in your power plant efficiency. Okay, so let's see what happens if we improve our light bulb um, efficiency from 2% to 10%. So instead, uh, we're, we're gonna, we're going to, um, we're going to change this number from, okay, previously 98% up to 90% efficiency. And so you can quickly kind of see how these numbers propagate all, uh, all throughout um, this, this chain. So from this uh, 
8% improvement, we end up reducing the primary energy usage going from 320 uh, down to 64. So you're getting an 80% reduction in primary energy. Um, and so, uh, like I was saying before, um, the improvements in the, the further down the pathway that you improve, um, uh, it, the efficiency and, and reduce the losses, then all of those savings will sort of propagate down that chain. Um, and so, like I was saying, strictly speaking, from a quantitative perspective, it's always better to um, it's always better to try and do sort of final uh, energy improvements as opposed to sort of upstream sort of primary energy improvements because because of this um, effect that happens. Um, but again, that having been said, oftentimes it's uh, a lot easier to to get sort of uh, more economically rational actors, centralized corporations um, to to make those improvements compared to trying to get people to do um, behavioral changes. And so these are these are kind of typical challenges that you you face in 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 these ideas of, of energy efficiency improvements. Um, okay. So I think what we'll do is we'll end here for today. Um, and again, I'll stick, or, I'll, I'll stick around for any questions if, uh, if there are any about the lecture or about the course in general. Um, and just as a reminder, we'll have our next lecture at the sort of normal times. And then next week, you can watch the lectures on um, your own time remotely. They'll be posted to, to Canvas or will, um, or you can uh, attend at the sort of off hours that, that will be happening at the end of the week. OK, thanks, everyone. Um, and I will see you guys all on. Thursday at 10 a.m. Thank you, Alan.